Hello and welcome to this lecture on GPU performance analysis. My name is Dominic Ernst. I'm a researcher here at the National High Performance Computing Center at FAU Erlangen Nuremberg in Germany. Let's look right at the code. I brought you a 2D Laplace solver, a 2D Jacobi sweep. It's a pretty common example because it's rather easy to understand. It's not a lot of code, but it exhibits some, some features that are interesting performance-wise. All right, we have a main function up here, and then we define a few constants, uh, allocate two different grids, a grid A and a grid B, one being the source grid and the other being the destination grid. And then we do some initialization, um, just zeros on the inside and, and one on the, on, on the border, just so that something happens. And then we have our actual iteration loop here that runs over the number of iterations that we've set before. We have inside here, we have the 2D loop over X and Y. And then on the inside here, we have the actual update, reading the data from grid B, the upper, lower, left and right neighbor, adding them together, dividing them by four, and writing that to grid A. After that's done, we swap the two grids so that the previous destination grid becomes the source grid and vice versa. And then we do the same thing again. We also do have some timing here. We have a, um, a timestamp T1 here, and then we take another timestamp T2. And then here with the DT, we can calculate the time that has passed between the two timestamps. And now that we have this, this duration data, the DT, we can compute some interesting data. And this is, here I want to show you something that the two most important tools for performance anal analysis aren't some fancy profilers, but actually a stopwatch and a calculator. Well, it's of course not a literal stopwatch because we're not standing there and actually pressing a stopwatch, but well, a timer and for a calculator, of course, we let the computer calculate the data that we want. What we do here in this line, we compute the effective memory bandwidth. And why we compute the effective memory bandwidth, I will say that in a moment because this code is a very heavily memory bandwidth bound and I will show in a moment that it is so. And um, we can calculate the, the effective memory bandwidth by thinking about what's the minimum, the essential amount of data that needs to be transferred for this Jacobi sweep to happen. And that basically is we need to read the grid B once and we need to write the grid A once. So the grid A and B are, have the size uh, width times height. We multiply that by the number of iterations. That's how many times we do that times the number times size of double, the number of um, bytes per element that we read. And then we multiply that by two because we have grid A and grid B. And um, yeah, then we divide that by the time that it actually took. And then we normalize that to gigabytes per second, just because it's um, easier to read than a very long number. All right. Now I've just said something about this being memory bound. And to get to this conclusion, we can use um, something called the roof line model, a very simple model that tries to explain what is the limiter or what's the maximum performance of the code. And for the roof line model, we need to look at two different things. One being the number of flops or floating point operations per second. The other being the, the, the data transfers, the the balance of the code, that is how many bytes or the arithmetic intensity. It's mostly the arithmetic intensity in the roof line model, um, which is how many floating point operations do we do per byte that we transfer from main memory. So we've already said that we want to read grid A and grid B or read or write um, those two grids at least once. So that means one element of the grid per grid cell update, which, which is what we call a lattice update. So that's one read and one write. So that's eight bytes each. That's 16 bytes per grid cell update. And we also, if we count that here, we see we have 
one, two, three plus plus operations, and then one multiplication. So that's four floating point operations per per um, lattice update. So four flops, sixteen byte, which would be zero point two five floating point operations per byte. And that now we can compare with the so-called machine balance. So how many floating point operations can the machine do per byte that it can transfer? To get a look at that, we'd go to the manufacturer side and I have that somewhere here. Well, this is not actually the manufacturer side, but I find this side to have the nicest collection of all the, all the different cards. Today, we're going to work with an NVIDIA A100 exit, um, yeah, NVIDIA A100. And th this NVIDIA A100 has, let's see, where, where do we have it? A maximum um, floating point rate of um, about 10 teraflops. And then a memory bandwidth of, where do I see it? Um, yeah, here, 1.5 terabyte. And if we take our calculator and divide one by the other, which is the, the 9.7 9.7 terabytes by the 1.5, uh, sorry, teraflop by the 1.5 um, terabyte, we get to around six flops, six floating point operations per byte. But our Git Jacobi sweep only does 0 0.25 floating point operations per byte. So transferring these bytes takes more time than actually doing these few calculations. So that's why we can easily see that this code is heavily memory bound and why we do not really need to concern ourselves with the gigaflop rate, how many flops are being done, because the rate with um, this rate is, is way below what the machine can do anyway, even the maximum, because the memory bandwidth will always be the limiter. All right, and that's also why we print the memory bandwidth. And important, it's the effective memory bandwidth that the application sees just by measuring the time. Why we plot the effective memory bandwidth down here. We will never quite get this 1,555, I think it was, gigabyte per second, because this is more of a theoretical rate that the interface, the memory interface would be theoretically capable of. And usually for codes, we cannot quite achieve that, which is why we usually use um, very simple kernels like copying data from one array to another to measure the actual reachable performance. For this, uh, in A100 is about, which is about 1.35 terabyte per second. So these 1,300 to 1,400 gigabyte per second are kind of our benchmark number. This is, um, what we want to get to, to as close to as possible. All right, our code example here on the left, let's, let's build this. And if you look at this right now, you actually see that I have a simple Pragma MP parallel four here. This is actually a CPU based code for now. There is no GPU part in here. And we will run the pure CPU version as a comparison. You can see here on the top how I compiled this, I used the NVIDIA C++ compiler, um, formerly known as the PGI compiler. Um, tell it to give me some info about what it's about OpenMP, which it does. It's, it tells us that it sees two OpenMP parallel sections, not much more. We tell them that later on, then when we do offloading, that it should be offloaded to the GPU, but that's not really relevant right now. And then, well, O3 for some basic optimization, but there's not much more going on here. Okay, when we test this, then it takes a while and then we get our time here and then a computed memory bandwidth, effective memory bandwidth. So 87 gigabyte per second is, um, this is this is the CPU value now. This is a two socket 64 core ROM um, machine and 87 gigabyte is actually a little slow for that machine. I know that the stream value should be higher. So I know that quite that this performance is not optimal and isn't as good as it could be. And this is because we have some NUMA issues here. I don't want to go into too much detail what NUMA issues are for CPUs because this is not a CPU optimization talk. But let me just tell you that by pinning all the threads that run to their respective cores, we can actually get somewhat higher 
memory bandwidth. If I run that again, you see some messages here about a lot of pinning. It is this liquid pin tool, which is developed here at this research center. Um, to do the, this pinning of, of, of threads to, to CPU cores. And we see now that we get this 191 gigabit per second, which is roughly, it mightn't be the very best, best version that's possible on the, on the CPU, but this is um, in the right ballpark. And I wanted to do this because I want to get, have a good CPU number as a comparison, because it's not uncommon that if there's an example of porting code from the CPU to the GPU, that a very bad CPU baseline is used. Maybe a totally unoptimized serial um, CPU version is benchmarked against an optimized, very well parallelized GPU version. And of course, then the GPU version wins out and gets, I don't know, factor 50 speed up, which is not actually quite fair. Because in reality, these two machines have the, the ratio of the memory bandwidth that, that they could get is more like something like five to 10, which is, um, yeah, more realistic. All right, so now we're going to port to the GPU. For this, I have prepared some versions using Git. We started out with the CPU base version. Now I'll check out the very first OpenP target version where we have these OpenMP annotation, target annotations, which um, tell, and then left side our code changed here. You might've noticed here that in the editor, the code changed. changed. And this target here tells the OpenMP compiler and the runtime to please offload that, these loops. And we also have this mapping directive here now, which tells the, also tells the OpenMP runtime to have this grid A and the grid B because we have the, the device, the system memory and we have the device memory and that, that there should be a separate version in the device memory and data needs to be copied there. Um, yeah, because the GPU cannot always work on system memory or should work on, on, on its own device memory on the card because that's much faster. And the CPU can only work on its own memory, exceptions to apply. All right, so let's benchmark this, let's build this. And let's benchmark this. We can already see that the compiler gives us now a little bit more output. We have here now in the second OMP target parallel do generating Tesla and multi-core code, and then it generated this GPU kernel. That's great. That's exactly what we wanted to do. It also tells us something about the parallelization that it parallelized across threads. Okay, I guess that's okay. And then it also generated this mapping, um, this mapping thing where it would map the data from system memory to device memory. Okay, let's execute this and um, see how fast this is. Or you can already see that this takes longer than it did before. So that's not a good sign. Yeah, we get three gigabyte per second, and it doesn't take um, it doesn't take a lot of math to see that this, this is much slower than the 191 gigabyte per second. So something is going very wrong. Our GPU version is much slower, and the question now is how do we find out why? What's happening here? Because what we see now, we we run this, and then it takes some time, and then we see a number at the end. So we know something is wrong, but we don't know what is wrong, and we can speculate and randomly change something and see whether something changes, but it's much easier to use, use a profiler to gain insight. NVIDIA for this does have the ENSYS, a profiler called ENSYS. And um, with the command ENSYS profile and then our executable, it now creates a profile. So ENSYS, just this, this, this executable is the command line interface tool that we can use here on the command line, which is nice. We can use that over SSH when we log in into a cluster on a remote machine. But there's also, um, there's also another tool called ENSYS minus UI, which is a graphical 
um, graphical tool. And for this, a graphical tool is, is quite nice because, because it can show us a nice timeline and it's much easier to examine that. And what is possible here, we can see that um, with this option, actually ENSYS hasn't given us much data uh, or much info. It just said that it's doing something and that it has now saved the report file to, well, actually it moved the, the report file to this report one.qd rep. And what we can do now is we can use the ANSYS UI, the actual graphical user interface to open this report file. And I have this report file installed on my local notebook. And um, this is the wrong tool. I have this installed on my, on my local notebook. So it runs as a local tool. Um, and this works even if you don't have an NVIDIA graphics card installed on your notebook because the, the tool itself doesn't need it. And now we can use it, but now we can use it to examine the result file. All right, we get some warnings, please go away. Now this looks pretty intimidating and not very um, intuitive. This will close this. You see that we have a bunch of a tree-like uh, structure here on the left you know, with the CPU and the threads. We close this thing because this is basically what happens on the CPU at the same time. And now we, we are already also going to increase the size of this a bit so that we see the important parts a little better. Now we have a um, thing here called CUDA hardware, which looks promising. We're going to um, extend this a bit. Then we have a bunch more categories that we can open. We open this one. So we have something called kernels and something called memory. And I think, yeah. This doesn't do much more. What we can see here with the kernels thing, if we zoom in a little, that this is basically the kernel that the OpenMP runtime generated. And this is when our kernel was run. And you can see that this kernel runtime is actually this super small sliver where it's running. And then in between, there's a big gap of nothing running. And also this 4% here means that 4% of the time, was spent actually running kernels. So that's not a lot. And, but 96% was spent doing something called memory. And if we zoom in and mouse over over these um, purple and green areas, we can see there's a memcopy device to host. And then the green one is a memcopy host to device. And what happens here is just this map clause is what we, what we told the compiler to do with this map clause. We told the compiler, hey, before this kernel runs, please copy up all my data from system memory to device memory, and then run the kernel and the kernel is done, and then copy back all our data from device to system memory. So this is the, the, the purple here is the, is the copy down, the copy back after the kernel ran. Then before the next kernel, we copy it up again, run the kernel, copy down, copy up, run the kernel, and so on, and so on, and so on. And with the, um, yeah, and this interface, I think on this machine, it's just, uh, it's just PCI Express. I don't know which version, but it's, it runs um, in the range of 10 to 20 gigabyte per second, depends on whether it's PCI Express 3 or, or 4. But of course, it's much, much slower than, um, than the actual GPU and than, than the actual code execution on the GPU. So we see, most of our time was spent transferring data. Very little time was actually spent computing something. All right, so we need to fix this. And we can do this with, Open, with OpenMP. What we can do is we can copy the data up once, do all our iterations, and then copy the data back down. And I have a version prepared for that. And I will not include the, the data transfer up and down into the timing anymore. You can argue about that, whether that's correct or not. But the thing is, we could imagine that we have a lot of iterations. And then the, if we have very many iterations, then these whole transfers, they would amortize over the number of iterations. And then this wouldn't matter anymore. So we have the changed code here on the left side. And what did change? One thing is this OpenMP target enter data. Um, statement and um, increasing the font size here a little bit, where we say basically the same thing. We have this mapping from grid A and grid B, but this time the data copy is done only once when this statement here is encountered. And only then does our timing and our iteration loop start. 
and done our um, pragma OMP target parallel four statement and our sweep here doesn't contain the mapping statement anymore because now we're not copying data anymore before and after um, the sweep loop. We have another loop here. And if you look closely, you see that this is actually just a copy. We copy the data from grid A to grid B. We draw it over the whole grid and just copy it from the former source to the new destination or the other way around. And this is because, um, yeah, before that, we used the swap idiom. And this doesn't quite work with OpenMP or, or with OpenACC. Because I think it's because when the mapping happens, then there's a fixed correlation between one pointer and the other pointer, or that this grid A or this thing here always refers to some specific device memory. This linking is fixed. And then when you change the pointers on the on the CPU, then the, the runtime won't, won't know that and, and won't update that the mapping has actually changed. I'm pretty sure it's possible somehow to use kind of like raw device pointers and say, hey, use this raw device pointers uh, to point to the update, but it doesn't look as nice anymore, which is very of why very often for uh, all the OpenMP or OpenACC examples for this kind of Jacobi sweep, they do this kind of copy loop right afterwards, just because the code stays simpler, I guess. So that's what we're going to do as well. All right, so we can build this thing again. We get a, a little bit more output because now we have a second. Um, we have a second uh, OpenMP loop here now, offloaded, of course, with the um, target statement. And we have here the target enter data statement now before the two actual loops. And when we run that, we hopefully don't need to wait as long for the, long for the results. And we don't need to. 136 gigabytes. So this is already much faster. Factor, I don't know, 30 faster than before. So this looks pretty good. It's not as fast as the CPU version, though. And it's also only a tenth of the potential performance of the, of the memory, well, the achievable memory bandwidth of the, this CPU as well. So there's still headroom, and we should improve on that. So let's do the same thing again. Let's do another profile, and this profile on Jacoby, and let's look at the profile again. So no, that was not it. Here, file open. Uh, practic interestingly or very conveniently, Ansys um, just numbers up the report. So our new report here is called report two because the report one was already already exists. Okay, again we close all these threads because that's what's happening on the system and with the CPU, and that's not very we're not not interested in this right now. We increase the size of this a little. And our picture here already looks different. We have a large part here, which is what we now know to identify as memory transfers. This is the host device. Initially, we've initialized our data on the CPU, and there we are copying up the data. You see that there is that the that, that, uh, um, corresponding copy down is missing. Um, which, you want, which is what you usually would do for actual, um, for an actual code because you need, you need to do something with the data. Otherwise, the computation would have been useless. But this is a benchmark. The computation is actually useless. And um, yeah, I've just omitted this for no particular reason. Just basically forgot to add a copy down. But it doesn't really matter because it's outside of the timing anyway. And here, our kernels here are, and our timing also only starts for this for this um, portion, so when it says here that 66 percent kernels and thirty four percent memory, that's for the whole runtime, um, but we're measuring only for this part, and imagine that this part would be taking much longer. So um, and this, but this part looks really good. There's kernels right kernel right after kernel. There's pretty much no bubbles in between. Only if we look very very closely, there might be something green shimmering through, which is probably a memory copy up for some of the data, some of the control data. Uh, what uh, for the kernel, how large the grid is and stuff. And what we can see is that also is, sorry, the two different kernels. We have here one and two. And this is our Jacobi sweep and our copy back. And they alternate one after another. And this is kind of, hmm, actually, it's not so satisfying because if we look at, because this one, this row here is doing the actual, 
sorry. These columns here are doing the actual useful work. And this one is just, um, it actually doesn't. It, it doesn't do anything useful. And it just um, transfers the data back so that we can refer, can, can swap basically the, the contents of the two pointers. And so the, the, the part here in between, the time spent for this is um, time not spent doing useful work. And we can prevent that. We can write this in a different way. Instead of just copying the data back, we can actually make this copy do useful work by making it a Jacobi sweep. And I have a version prepared doing this. I call this a ping pong sweep because we, we work from one, one buffer to the other and then back. So we check this out, see how the code changes. And now you see we have one sweep, sweep from grid B to grid A. And then we have the respective back sweep from grid A to grid B. And now both of them do useful work. Also the iteration count for each loop now um, comes up by two instead of just incrementing by one, because now we do two iterations, um, two sweeps for each outer loop iteration. And uh, we can count both of them as useful work. So let's build this. And then we can benchmark this. And now with the now we see with with the 220 gigabyte per second that we get that we just get more useful work out of this. And you already see, I mean, we haven't actually changed this part, but this number here increased. This is because here we compute the effective or useful gigabyte per second, and we hadn't included the the, the memory transferred by this copy loop because it's not useful work. And so yeah, so we haven't included the, this here. But, um, and that's why I didn't contribute before, but since we, since now that's useful work, we haven't changed the computation here, of course, but since we're only doing half as many iterations now, um, our timing actually changed. All right, all right, 220 gigabyte per second is already faster than the CPU, at least by a bit. I think we had 190 gigabyte per second on the, CPU, we have now 220 gigabyte per second on the GPU, so we're faster, but we're still off of the stream value that we could get in theory. So remember that this would be something like 1.3 or 1,300 gigabyte per second. So um, there's still headroom. And this is somewhat difficult because now um, for the, in, in, in this profiler, um, it's difficult to see. We just see that it takes up time, but we cannot really look into the kernel execution. Why is this? Why does this run the way it does? And there's another tool that's explicitly made for this kind of um, looking inside code execution, looking inside uh, a kernel call. And for this, we there's another tool called MCU. It works in a, in a similar way. We run this NCU tool on the command line. It does give us some information. So I will run it just without anything, just NCU on Jacobi. It will run the whole thing and it will actually replay some of these, um, it will replay all the kernels. That's why it says here 11 passes because it measures performance counters, but it can only do so many, I think, I don't know how many. It can only do a limited set of performance counters per run, but it wants to measure multiple metrics. So it actually runs each kernel 11 times. And each time it measures another set of performance counters. And that way it can get all the data that it wants to. All right, this gives us this kind of um, a section like this. You see here in VCOM, this is one call and all the data that comes afterwards. This is one instance, or one kernel call. It gives us some information about this here. It says um, this, this section is called GPU speed of light. It's, that's where they kind of try to tell, give you an indication um, whether more the memory part or more the in-core or shader um, part is the limiting part for the execution. And we can see something here is called this SOL for speed of light, or this is kind of how much of the maximum. And it says here's 13% of the maximum which is of course not a lot. So, um, and which is in line with what with, with what we saw already of only a tenth being used roughly. But then it also says that of the L1 texture cache, we have about seventy percent of the speed of light. So, 
For this, for this, for the L1 texture cache, only 30% are left unused. So it's almost fully utilized. And then L2 cache only 30%, whatever that means. And then SM, so that's basically the actual computations and instruction execution, only 2% or 2.5%. Two, two so basically nothing. All the execution units are spent most of the time sitting idly, very probably waiting for data. And if we take this, if we take and take this for, for true, then it probably waits for the L1 cache most of the time. But this is kind of interesting because we shouldn't, this kind of code shouldn't use the cache that much, but should be should be limited by the by the memory bandwidth. And the L1 cache is a factor, as at least a factor 10 or more faster than the DRAM, so it shouldn't become a limiter that much. Okay, well, let's keep that in mind and look a little further what we see here as well. We see something about the launch statistics. We see that it has launched a grid of um, almost 20,000 um, um, thread box. We have, um, our grid has a size of 20,000 by 20,000. So it basically runs as many thread blocks as there are um, rows in this grid. This, um, yeah, doesn't tell us much about whether this is good or not. Not very many registers per thread and some other stuff, um, which, which doesn't tell us much. And then also here, it would tell us if we had if, for example, the registers would be a limit for the um, for the occupancy, but it's not. So this is not the not not really an issue. We can get a lot more. So this is basically kind of the short version. There's also something called sections. I think with minus minus list sections, we would get kind of these um, other things that we could that, that this could output on the on the command line what we saw so far were the launch statistics the schedule you know, the occupancy and the occupancy and the speed of light and um yeah we're not going to look at the other ones because we're going to for now we are going to collect many much more data and we're going to write it out to a file and then examine this in a GUI tool okay i use this minus minus set full which means please just profile all the sets. Uh, override if, if this file already exists and minus O profile one means please write out the data to profile one. The behavior there differs a little from the other tool in not out automatically numbering up. And by doing this, this will take at least a bit of time because you will see that we now need many more pa passes because we requested a lot more data. So we need now 33 passes to measure all the counters that we that we want. So naturally it takes a little longer. Okay, now we use this other, other tool, Inside Compute. It's the, um, I can close this real quick. If I open a terminal, this tool, the, the UI, but this is called MCU minus UI. The other one compared to the command line interface tool, which would just be called NCU. And the same thing with NSYS and NSYS UI. But now we call NCU UI because we want this thing. So hopefully then we can do open file here to open an already recorded file. We could start all the recording from this inside this program, but the thing is, um, since I don't have a GPU, well, I do have a GPU, but not definitely not an A100 in my notebook. Um, I don't want to do it inside this, but I want to examine a file that I've already looked at, that I've recorded on the cluster. We have this profile one thing here. I think it is already done. Yeah, the, it says here that it uh, has um, saved this thing to profile one. So that's what we're going to open. This is going to probably take a while to load. Yeah, there we are. We have here on the, up here, we have a menu where we can um, select which ones of the um, kernels that are being called we actually want to use. And since they're, they're all very similar, the data will probably change only by very tiny amounts. Um, so it doesn't really matter which one we take. Maybe not the first one, I don't know. Maybe there's some kind of warm up effect, but it didn't appear to be the case. We have up here this GPU speed of light um, thing again that um, gives us basically the same information that we previously saw. Now we have a nice bar chart here that tells us memory has been busy 50% and SM only 2.4%. Also gives a little bit of a breakdown for um, 
for the SM resources and for the memory resources, how much how much they were used. We see some kind of L1 metric data pipe LSU wavefronts as being a limiter. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't um, say much, doesn't tell us much what this exactly would be, but it seems to be something with the L1 cache going on. Um, so let's just keep it in mind. Maybe this will give us a hint um, about what's actually happening. All the other stuff to be to be true that isn't terribly interesting. So we'll skip over over most things. There's a lot of info here. A lot of the info, to be honest, doesn't say a lot or is probably just not very interesting for this particular kernel. So we're not going to look at this, but sometimes there might also be very valuable and very interesting information. Depends very much on the application. But I think the most interesting one for things that are do something with memory is this memory workload analysis. And here we see that this kind of overview over the over the cache or memory hierarchy of the GPU. We have on, our, on the very left our kernel. We have then in the middle we have this L1 texture cache block, then our L2 cache block, and then on the very side, right hand side, well, this box with system memory isn't interesting because peer memory is also not interesting, but device memory is the thing that we care about. And you also can see that some of these um, arrows are brighter color than the others. So um, these other ones were actual data has flown. Okay, we see on these arrows, we also see data volume data. And um, well, I don't know, is, is 11.92 gigabyte much? Well, it depends. And to get a perspective on, how, on that, we can now use our second favorite tool, which is the calculator. And um, let's see whether we can make some sense of, of some of these numbers here. We can put this window right above here because all the stuff that my calculator window occupies right now is not interesting for us. So we have a grid, it's 20,000 by 20,000. And um, We have two of those, 20,000 by 20,000. And um, yeah, right. 20,000 by 20,000 is, um, 40, is 40 million. This isn't quite, I don't know, this doesn't relate to anything that we see now here on the screen, uh, actually. 20,000, that uh, was confused for a moment. And let's first look at this request number here, this um, or this instruction or request number. This means 62 million load instructions and then 50 million, you see the, the errors go in a certain direction. This goes from right to left. So this, these are reads and the other one are writes. And um, sorry, each of these write operations or read operations works for a whole warp of 32 threads. So we can divide this number by 32 to see how many instructions there should be. And if we do that, we get to 12.5 million. Um, so you see, yeah, I have the scientific mode activated. So this is 12.5 million. And we find that number here in the, um, I don't know whether you can, can see my mouse. Um, in this case, when I point to something, um, so I'll use the drawing functionality. We can use see that number here for the store instructions. We have one store instruction per cell. So um, this totally makes sense. We also do have four times 12.5 million write instructions. That's four per cell because we read the left, right, upper, and, and bottom neighbor of each cell. And that's how we get the 50 million requests. And in total, adding them two together is 62 million. So that already works out great in the number of instructions. Okay, let's go a little bit further to the L1 texture cache block. We have a hit rate here of 91%. Um, that sounds pretty good, but actually isn't as good as it sounds. And it, we cannot, right, now, right now, we cannot really relate that to anything that makes any kind of sense. So let's skip it for a moment but believe me that it's not as good as it sounds. And then we have two data values here. We have this 3.8 gigabyte and this 11 point, like 
3.8 gigabytes loaded and 11 gigabytes written. And we can do again some calculations um, with our calculator, again, doing the 20,000 by 20,000. This time we multiply it by eight byte. This is eight byte per, for double precision value, eight byte per cell. And um, if we do that, we get to 3.2 gigabyte per second. And if we look at the whole memory hierarchy, we can actually recognize the, the, this 3.2 gigabyte number somewhere here, which is here, the amount of data loaded and the amount of data stored. So we do load for, we do for each cell of the grid A and the grid B, we load one, one, um, one value, we read one value. So this is great. This means that of, out of all the data that we load from device memory, we have 100% efficiency that uh, we don't load more data than is strictly necessary and we don't write more data than is strictly necessary. So this data is great, but some of the data that's not great is the numbers that are bigger and especially this one. I really don't like this, this writing number here, this 11 gigabyte. We write 11 gigabyte to the O2 cache. And the question there is why? Because we we write each entry of the of the of this um, destination array just once, so there shouldn't be there shouldn't be any increase. And um, yeah, to see to get an, to get an impression of why this happens, or this is kind of a tell about what what happened here, and um, what did happen is. Um, to know what, what did happen, we have to look at the, and how the OpenMP runtime did parallelize our code. I'll have to clear the, all the annotations because they're now on the way. I have a grid here for, um, that represents now our grid A and B. Of course, it's a little smaller than it would be in reality. And um, yeah, so basically what does happen is that the OpenMP runtime, we've written here, not here, but here, we've written here that it want, that we should parallelize this Y loop. So it, now it has mapped this loop over Y over the threads and thread blocks of, of the GPU. So, so where was it skipping? Here. One thread works on, I don't want that to happen. Just give me a straight line. Thank you. Um, one thread, maybe I'm just going to actually paint, paint in this because I think it would be visible a little better. So this is the data that we have a hypothetical warp here that has just two, that's just four wide, just because my grid drawing gets less easy. So the first thread works on this cell, the second thread works on this cell, the third thread on this and the fourth one on this. And now when they when they read, this thread reads um, this neighbor, this neighbor, this neighbor, and then the, the second one reads these two and so on. And for writing, we now, um, this, this first thread here writes this value and well, the other one write their respective values. And what happens now is that we have cache lines here and our, um, the order in which memory is arranged here is actually, am I using the wrong tool for this? Just one straight lines. I think this used to, used to work that way. Oh, okay. Never mind. Not like this. Um, yeah, then I use no straight lines today. I think I can do straight lines here too. Yeah. And the memory is actually arranged this way in this zigzag pattern. So X first and then, then Y in this linear kind of fashion. And then cache lines are actually these blocks of four values. Should have used a different color because it becomes a little unwieldy now. Cache lines are actually arranged in these kind of blocks. So each time a, a value is written, um, the thread only writes the data here, the very first value here of this cache line. And the next thread writes the very first entry of this cache line. And 
on, on NVIDIA GPUs, when data is written, it gets written directly through to the L2 cache and it needs to transfer this whole cache line for the write, even though just the single value here has been, has been touched. So four times, four times the amount of data needs to be transferred um, than would be strictly necessary. This wouldn't be too bad in itself because the L2 cache path would be might be slow it might be fast enough to still cover this kind of because it's the two caches of course faster than the DRAM so it might be fast enough to actually absorb this this four x amount of, of of write volume but what also happens is that the, the the reading of the data that we have very large strides in here because since the very first thread is is writing this data this whole cache line. Or maybe I have to undo some writings because since when I'm already when I always overdraw the previous data, then we cannot see anything anymore. So this thread here loads um, loads this value as well, and the next thread below loads this one, and the stride from here to here is um, that far. So the whole line here. And the L1 cache can only deliver a single cache line per cycle. So, or actually four cache lines per cycle. But, um, but because all these threads access very different cache lines, it takes one cycle for each of those, to, to compute each of those threads. And in the best case, it would have taken only two cycles to, to, to process all the threads done by the 32 threads in a walk. But this way, it takes one cycle for every one of the threads. So it, th it takes 32 cycles instead of just two. So due to this bad access pattern, this strided access pattern, the L1 cache can deliver only a 16th of its actual speed, of its um, best possible speed. And that's why the L1 cache is so, um, so utilized, so highly utilized. And um, yeah, this kind of access pattern is, is just bad. Another thing to, to consider here, except for just the access pattern, is that, um, that this dimension here on the, so this Y dimension is only 20,000 long. And you run one thread here per, per site per, per, per row. So only, we also only get a parallelism of about 20,000 threads. And this device can, easily do up to 200,000 threads. So we only run a 10th of the possible amount of threads. And even, even so we don't need the full amount of threads, so the whole 200,000, we not, don't need 100% occupant occupancy. 10% um, occupancy is a little low. So we don't have enough parallelism to actually fully utilize our GPU. So this code suffers from both bad access patterns and underutilization. So, we need to fix this to get higher memory bandwidth. Okay, what can we do about this? Let's clear all these drawings. What can we do about this? Um, so far, we've told the OpenMP runtime, please parallelize this loop here. Um, we left this other one out here. And what we can do, we can add these collapse clauses here. And I've prepared a version of that, of course. Um, no, what I wanted to do, please check out this 2359 collapse, collapse version. And if we look at this now, I've modified it, so I need to reload the file. Yes, I want to discard my edits. Yes, thank you. Okay, now you see this collapse to clause. This tells the OpenMP run the compiler to please take both of these loops and collapse them into one long loop, one 1D one loop, and then parallelize over the, this, these combined loops. And what this will do to our grid here is that now threads will do, threads won't do, will be in the, no, I want you to want to draw, I'm not using Inkscape, okay. No, the first thread will do this one, and the next thread then will do the next next loop iteration in x direction, which will be this one, and then the next one will do this one, 
and the next one this one and now we have a warp doing this kind of nicely contiguous line of threads and then now if we write data for example um then these four threads they write nicely to the same cache line giving us much higher efficiency um for the writing and also for the reading because now the requests of these four threads can be uh, satisfied can be served in a single single cycle so this kind of pattern should be much faster and we also get much more parallelism because now we get 20,000 times 20,000 threads which is way enough to fill our gpu fully all right let's let's benchmark this you know build this code again does it tell us anything here not really it didn't really say that it collapsed the loops well it's just not in the output let's run this again and now we get much better bandwidth now we get 740 gigabytes per second this is um and before i think you got 220 gigabytes per second so this battery access pattern is much faster we let's collect some data about this and let's look again and we call let's we're going to call this profile too just so that we see the difference we run this again and collect the whole thing and then look what look at what changed this is of course going to take a while i hope it it could be a little faster because now our speed is also a bit faster Let's go to the right tool. This one here. There's a neat feature. I hope that works where you can compile it to different reports. We shouldn't open this too quickly because it's probably not done. Yeah, it's done. Profile two, open this. Uh, we have again this picture here. Now our shader is actually used much more because now since we um, use much more of the actual memory bandwidth. Our actual, our actual performance is much higher, so um, the, the, the shader have much more, um, also more busy because now they're um, used more. So that's why we have a 20% speed of light memory here. Then we have, I don't know whether you, um, all the stuff that I'm clicking, I think you can't see it. So I'm going to clear all my drawings and use my highlighter again. We have a now 82% speed of light of memory which is pretty good. Only 21% for the L1 um, um, cache. So this is way down, much less busy. Um, yeah, and also here in the detailed breakdown, um, it's, um, it's the same, same thing that we see, 82% DRAM. And there's a bunch of L2 and other stuff that can tell us much right now. And if we scroll down a little as well, we can look at the memory workload analysis. Like I said, my favorite view. Um, and let's move to clear my drawings. We can look at the data again. Nothing really changed for the number of requests, of course, and instructions that stayed all the same. Our hit rate in the O1 cache went down. And like I said, this is kind of good. Oh, well, the, the, the high hit rate in the, in the O1 cache wasn't as good as it sounded because the high hit rate, how that came to pass is, well, the first thread it started doing, this is a bad color and a different okay. The first thread started doing um, this, this element. And then as the next one, it would do this one. And of course, all the data from this cache line would already be there. So there would be a high hit rate just because, because of this kind of access pattern, this linear access pattern. There would be a lot of data already be there just because the, ca the whole cache line was already fetched. But the rest of the cache line was fetched anyway with the first access. So this is not really a, a kind of reuse where we say, oh, we can use the same value again, but this is data that has been, um, we already have this high granu granularity of fetching data, of fetching full cache lines and we're just um, reaping the benefits here. So this high cache, this high um, hit rate in the one cache wasn't really something that benefited us at all. And I'm actually happier with this, with the lower, somewhat happy with the lower thread. Okay, and then for the volumes, we have this 3.34 gigabyte per second now for storing data. So that means we store only a single value per cell. So this looks better. We now have a higher read bandwidth here. 
And we also, if we go down to the to the DRAM, we have the right, um, the correct store volume, three gigabyte, but our um, load volume is a little high. Um, just as a remark, if sometimes we have three point, we have this three point two gigabyte. Actually, if we divide that by thousand um, by two to the power of thirty, so that's for giga, we get to this two point nine eight. Um, because we shouldn't really get lower numbers than we than we, than we calculate. Um, so this makes sense that this is that that uh, that we store three gigabyte, and we also we actually compute three gigabyte. So our writing volumes are. Are down, so that's good. But our load volumes are up. Now we have worse load volumes. And for this, for the L1 cache, for the for the L2 to L1 cache volume, it actually looks like we have pretty much three times three times three gigabytes for for getting the nine gigabytes. And um, there's a reason for that too. We can actually, um, if we think about how how threads are now scheduled, we can actually derive this value as well. So um, let me, no, I don't want that much. Let me do, let me draw this. Now we have a thread running these, these four cells here. And what these four cells, what these four threads do, they load the top neighbor, neighbor, so these are these ones. They load the right neighbor, so this one, and then yeah, okay, there's some overlaps here already, and then they load the left neighbor. This is basically all the values that have already been loaded, and then this one as well, and the bottom neighbor, so this one as well. And now, what happens that in the it happens now that in the L1 cache, you see that um, there's some overlap of the data. So this thread here, this yellow thread, would load this piece of data and this piece of data. And then another thread, maybe this one here, it would also load this piece of data. And because th these two threads run in the same L1 cache, the same as M, they can share this data, this, this piece of data. They won't reload that. So um, all the accesses here on this central line will be, will be loaded just once and then reused by all the threads. But the data here in this upper line and this lower line they're not shared by the thread, so they have to be transferred as well. And this is where we see if we um, would extend this line far enough, and in the reality, it would be something like 128 because we the open pre runtime chooses a thread box size of 128 by default. We have, um, if we extend this line by long enough, we have for each, for each cell, we would need to load the, its own value, this one. Okay. So many more colors would load its own value, its upper value and the lower value. And this is why we see the factor three in the, um, in the amount of data that's being loaded. And this is also why we see a hit rate of exactly 25% because of all, because of the four excesses that it does. One is a miss. Well, let me, let me undo a few of those to get a little bit, to make everything a little bit clearer. Um, so this one here, this neighbor here loads loads some data. One of them is a miss. Another one is a hit because the other neighbor has loaded this data as well. Then this one, the upper one is a miss again. The other one is a miss again. So you see that one out of four is a hit and that's a hit rate of 25%. That's why we get exactly this hit rate of 25%. All right, and then Okay, yeah, this is the picture how we explain this, this about nine gigabytes, three times uh, this other value that hit rate of 25%. Now in the L2 cache, it should be in theory, now we have different threads running on different, um, on different SMs. They should be able to share data. Sorry, I want to undo that, draw again. Okay, so one thread running on one SM and another thread running on another SM and they should be able to share data in the L2 cache. And then what would happen is that the upper thread would, for example, load these values because it, um, you know, it kind of loads this data in this kind of star. And then the, the thread below it would load these values so they could share this value and load that one only once. 
And that way we should have only one value per cell being loaded. But in reality, it, it, it boils down to about two because we have a, a, around double the, 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 the data volume, that the minimum data volume that should be happening. And um, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure why it's that bad, but I assume that because we run these, we run the threads in these kind of long lines, that some of the threads are further in the, in the execution and then, then other threads. So maybe um, instead of doing these two threads very close to each other, we would run, run thread would be doing um, these down, one down here, and the other one would still be busy with this here. And then before this thread starts utilizing this amount of this data that the lower thread um, has already brought in, maybe that thread data is already evicted. So it's probably desynchronization of threads that they're not probably, probably running in lockstep and probably, probably using the data um, in the L2 cache. That's why we get a rather bad, uh, rather high volume. And this is, this is kind of bad because even though we have a pretty, I think somewhere here we can see the, um, no, 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 a lot of drawings. Let's um, clear that real quickly. We have a rather high, I think we somewhere we can see the, um, the DRAM bandwidth. Well, we can see that up here, it says somewhere that we have 82% utilization of the memory interface, and this is, it doesn't get much higher. And I've seen um, many papers where they have a kernel and they analyze the performance and then they measure the, the, the memory bandwidth of the hardware. And then they say, well, we use, we fully utilize the memory interface, so our code is good. If we have a memory bandwidth limited problem, we fully utilize the memory bandwidth, so um, our code is perfect. And this is not actually true because even though the hardware transfers a lot of data, it's also the question, how high is the efficiency of this data? Even though there's high utilization of the memory bandwidth, the efficiency of the memory bandwidth could be low. And this is what happens here, we have these 6.79 gigabyte, even though it could be as low as three gigabyte. So our efficiency is only about 50%, even though our utilization is high. And this is also why we see in the actual performance numbers with these about 700 gigabyte per second, um, which is our effective um, memory bandwidth, the useful memory bandwidth. This is why this number is still off the 1300 that we could get. And I think that the hardware is transferring, actually transferring about 1,300 gigabytes per second. And I'm pretty sure there's some kind of these panels that actually tells us, ah, yeah, here, when we throw put terabyte per second, here, there it is. Um, here, 1.3 terabyte per second. So this is as high as it goes, but our efficiency is bad. All right, so what can we do to increase the efficiency and, um, I don't really have a have like a great solution for this. I only have like a somewhat of a solution for this. Usually, if you would write a CUDA program, this wouldn't be an issue for this kind of code. The simplest code would actually already get great performance because it, normally, if you were write, would write a CUDA kernel, you would have this kind of two D thread block map, mapping scheme where a thread block would not just be this line of, uh, of a bunch of thread, but it would be a 2D group of threads like, um, yeah, let's make it three by three. This is kind of a weird thread block, but let's just pretend. And would schedule this kind of three by three block. And now if we look at that, um, one thread here in the middle, and it's this different color, would access these outer values here. It's, it's all these neighbors. And then the next one would access these other neighbors. And if we paint the whole, would paint all the all the points for all the threads in here, we would load all the would load one more one more, oh, not this one, not this one. Would load one more value outside of this and all the ones on the inside. And then here on the inside, there would be a lot of re reuse because this particular this particular middle and development uh, value in the middle, sorry, this one would be required for this thread, this thread, this thread, and this thread. So there would be a lot of reuse. And if we would increase the size of this thread block um, 
to be very large, then it would be in the limit the um, the ratio of red points to points to points on the inside. So actually, threads being run inside this thread block would be one. So one value loaded per thread. It's not quite that high because um, a thread block cannot be infinitesimally small, in, in, infinitesimally, infinitesimally large, but um, at least it becomes much better. And this kind of squarish shape, this 2D shape, is a much better cache utilization in the L1 cache than this kind of linear shape that we're running right now. And we can approximate this kind of um, 2D form even with something like OpenMP or OpenACC by writing, and I've prepared a version for that, we change the, the, the amount of data that, that a single thread is going to work on. And yeah, this is the final version already. See how, let's see how it changes. What I've done here, I have now this outer loop that ran over Y and I've taken blocks of four. You see that we now have this increment plus equals four, and I've pulled this to the inside. We have this small loop here, the inner y that runs from zero to four, uh, well, to one, three, two, four. And then the, the actual y coordinate is reconstructed as outer y plus inner y. And now we would parallelize over the outer two loops, but we leave the inner loop unparallelized. So a single thread is going to do all four updates um, here, inside here. And um, yeah, only the other two loops get parallelized. And what happens now inside, inside this grid is that the data now being done by a single thread. No, I actually want to draw something, please by a single thread here, it does not just do that one, but it does do four of these elements. And since we, we can replicate, since we are now have a line of threads doing work, the next th thread is going to, to do these values and then the other one, these values. Now we can, you can see that now we have a, this kind of 2D shape inside a thread block or this 2D shape inside the uh, level one cache. And we get some, a little bit of a 2D shape that um, can replicate some of um, this kind of better caching behaviors. Let's run this. Let's see whether what I told you actually holds true and we actually do get higher performance. And we actually do. We now get 1,100 gigabyte per second. This is still not quite 1,300 terabyte per, um, gigabyte per second. So our efficiency is still not quite as high as it could be. And if we if we'll, um, let run that real quickly, then we can also make a few comparisons on how the data volumes changed. Um, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of different other thread mapping schemes would be possible. Uh, maybe even put a... Um, an actual 2D loop inside, so that actually runs over a 2D tile. And there's also some, some open P and also open to ACC options for different kind of, uh, for iterations inside a thread block and um, how to map th um, thread blocks to iterations, this kind of thing. And so this is definitely not the perfect or optimal thing. Um, also take care that this only works like this for um, if we have a, multiple of four as the sizes, which I've cheekily done up here. And you see that now we have 20,002. So that divides minus, if we, if we deduct two for the two border elements, then we get a divisible number by, um, by four. So let's open this again. And I think I've actually overwritten now, um, no, no project. I want to open a file. I've overwritten the profile too, unfortunately. I probably should close this first and then open the file profile two. That's nothing really has changed here. But if we go further down to the memory workload analysis section, now we can see that our numbers here changed a little. We have now um, actually a higher hit rate in the L1 cache, 50%, which is now which is because we now share data. Um, share much more data inside the level, level one cache. We have a lower read 
um, value from level two to level one because much more data is cached inside the level one cache. Store hasn't changed, which is fine. And also our read value from, from the DRAM um, went down. It's still not perfect, but it, at least it went down a little bit. And I'm pretty sure that the remaining um, 200 gigabytes per second would be found if it were possible to reduce this 3.6 to three gigabyte per second. Um, I'm not doing the math right now, but I'm pretty sure that's about the ratio, the missing ratio. Um, yeah. So, and so, yeah, you can definitely play around this with, with this and see whether you come up with a better scheme to do this. And um, do your research. I would be interested if you find something better. But this whole thing, and I really wanted to show you all the detail about all this data here. Now you can use a calculator to kind of um, deduce these numbers on what these numbers should be, because your performance shouldn't be like a black box where you run something and you say, well, I don't know what happens. You can actually um, deduce a lot of things about what happens inside a kernel if you think about what your code does and then use a calculator. And if the numbers don't add up, there's one of two things could be happening. One, your understanding of your code is wrong, which is a valuable insight, or B, your understanding of what the hardware is doing is wrong, which is also a valuable insight because this could be a hint that something is going wrong and something is not going um, the way it should or the, the perfect way. And um, gives you hints about, um, about what's happening inside your code and gives you insights. All right, that's already everything from me. Um, and thank you for listening. <laughs>